in the world, allow me to wish you a warm and hearty African welcome to the first ever virtual industry summit for Geo Week 2020, being beamed, proudly beamed, uh, to all across the world from sunny South Africa, which I can remind you is also the home of the Rugby World Champions. So um, the, the, the focus today, uh, the industry track, is set up as a conversation between Geo and the private sector, all focused on looking for ways of, of increasing synergy and productive collaboration between the private and public sectors. My name is Kamal Ramsing. I'm the chairperson of ZA Space, which is our space and geospatial industry body here in South Africa. And I'm proudly going to be your host for the next two days, addressing this particular issue of conversation between geo and the industry sector. Now, no event like this can go without recognizing what 2020 has been for all of us. No nation, no industry, no sector, no family, no community can claim to have been unscathed by the pandemic. It has changed our world, our lives forever. And despite this, we as the human race are here together looking for those opportunities that have come from, from the heightened focus on Earth observation and geospatial technologies. The pandemic in its very nature necessitated a geospatial response. It required innovative use of Earth observation technologies. It required innovative use of the data that we had. And it required sharing of data and insights all across the planet. What an amazing time to be in the sector. Now, with, with that type of heightened expectation, and of course, we're all expecting the post-pandemic world to be one underpinned by a far greater understanding of and appreciation for all things Earth, Earth observation and geospatial. This heightened demand, this, this heightened sense of understanding of the art of the possible will come with, with greater expectations. And I guess with greater expectations come intense considerations for some things that we might not have thought about before. For example, how do we democratize access to data, to space assets that can be used by the least developed countries in the world to benefit in the same way as all do? How do we increase the attractiveness of the sector to attract greater skills into, into the industry so that we may go forward across the world again dealing with these, with these issues? How do we improve the collaboration between public and private sectors to be able to generate better insights, better opportunities to grow the sector overall? But most of all, I guess, we should be pondering how do we make it possible, how do we better empower the generations to come with better solutions, better technologies, better insights, so they might be better prepared than we've been. It's really a profound time to be debating this, and personally, I don't believe there's ha ever been a higher level of relevance to these discussions than it is this year. This is the year to make a difference using Earth observation technologies. I'm very excited by this. I'm very excited by the conversations and by the fact that we've structured the next two days to answer some of these questions, obviously highly, highly dependent on the participation from you, all of the attendees over the next two days, not just the presenters or the facilitators or the, or the panel participants, but the audience itself. So, so please r provide us with your questions, your inputs, your feedback. You would have seen from all the publications that our theme this year is about enabling access with a very specific focus on SMMEs, quite simply because no industry can grow without specific support for current SMMEs and a mechanism to attract new entrants into the industry. So this theme of enabling access to markets, to partners, to resources, and to insights is very, very near and dear to us over the next two days. And we've done a few things to make sure that we live up to that promise. Firstly, our networking session. This will run continuously over the next two days. So please, if you haven't already, complete your profiles, open your calendars, uh, click on the people that you'd like to network, book time with them, and interact with people from all over the world. That's, the, that's one of the biggest outcomes we'd like to achieve today. Of course, if you're so busy networking and you miss some of the live sessions, no, no, no worries. Click on the On Demand tab. That, that stores all of the recorded content. Give us five or 10 minutes from between sessions before it updates, but you can retrieve it all there. And of course, if you, like me, want to plan the next two days, the Resources tab will have uh, a downloadable agenda. 
and some some speaker notes as well might be posted on there so please go down go down and have a look at that and of course let us not forget the exhibitions the exhibitors this year have expended huge effort to put their best foot forward on the exhibition stand so make some time to have a look at the exhibition stands fantastic welcome again that takes care of the of the of the basic introductions we are about ready to kick off with some of our keynote speakers and the two keynotes we have this morning Neither of them need any introduction to the, to the GEO community at all. The first one up is Dr. Gilberto Camara. And Dr. Gilberto has been a um, GEO Secretary Director since mid-2018. Apart from that, he's, he's achieved one of the biggest, to my mind, achievements was to be linked with the biggest environmental success story in the decade. And this is during his tenure as Director General of Brazil's National Institute for Space Research. This is when remote sensing was used to reduce deforestation in the Amazon by as much as 80%. That is truly, truly phenomenal. I think the world is in your debt, sir. Thank you for making time to be with us today. We're really looking forward to your content. I've had a sneak preview of it, so, so I'm really looking forward to it. And Gilberto, over to you. Thank you so much, and thanks to the whole uh, organization of the symposium, uh, to SENSA for organizing it, to ZZ Space for bringing together the group of industry to the industry tech coordinators. So without further ado, let me jump in the issues here. And today I'm going to talk about the issues of open source software and the old private sector. So it's not like uh, this is the fantastic it solve all the problems of the private sector but i'm taking one specific but let's say element of a business model of the private sector and going on from there to analyze what is the what can it bring for our uh, the, the private sector especially the smmes let's look at the situation first of all i think we share and we know that we share uh, a goal between GEO and the community and the private industry, which is the, to empower the world. Uh, as, 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 as the president as was said in the beginning, we need, we have now more data than ever before and more data is coming every day. And therefore, uh, cloud platforms seem to be the most efficient way to organize that, that data sets. But that uh, data on the cloud does not speak by itself. It needs uh, knowledge to put it up and that knowledge cannot be on only the hands of a few, but has to empower institutions, it has to empower uh, SMMEs, it has to empower the whole world. So we have to be uh, cognizant that we need to be uh, absolutely open to get everyone on board. And how do we do that? Well, let's look at SMMEs. This is, uh, there's hard, it's hard to find data. So I'm using the data from the European Association of Remote Sensing Companies as a proxy uh, to the situation of private sector uh, around the globe. But I don't think it's too far from the truth. Now, the point here is uh, the in Europe, and I think in, the, in, the, in general, 85% of the brains of the technicians are in SMMEs. So that's vast, vast majority of everyone is on small and medium large companies. The other point to make is that there are the tailored services, the services that you do uh, human to human, let's put it this way, make as much as 90% of the services that the companies have. In other words, uh, the systems which, let's say, if you compare to the internet, compare systems like uh, well, Twitter, or Facebook, or other other big players, where things are largely automated, are not the are certainly not the norm on Earth observation. You have the tailored, fully automated tailored surface, the one that you know people start, had startups are less than ten percent, which means that most of the time of the brains of the SMEs are spent customizing services for specific customers and that means that there it's it's a different profile in terms of outreach 
to users. At the same time, given the data that we have is, uh, is bigger than ever before, we're having a gold rush to EO technology. What I call the gold rush is everybody's trying to get a piece of this uh, big data and to, of course, uh, monetize, as the American would say, uh, that uh, in, in favor, of course, of growth, of economic growth. And that has led to a very fragmented landscape. This is everything in his brother. You have big players like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. You have open source software in Esri. You have open source software like Orfeo 2 Box, uh, Snap from ESA. And you have uh, uh, open solutions like the Open Data Cube, Brazil Data Cube from, from uh, uh, Open Data Cube is largely now a consortium started at Australia. And now it's a, it's a big, big consortium. And you have private solutions like Ely from Teradui. So there is everybody and his brother. And the question here is, have we seen this movie before? Not so long ago, I mean, not so long ago in human terms, when I was doing, uh, I remember uh, there was a time when everybody, every company had her own, its own flavor of Linux. There was Solaris, AIX, Ultrix, Next, IRIX, IHPUX, FreeBSD, OpenSBSD, and what have, what have you. Now this is largely gone. Amazon, Google, Android, everybody uses Linux. Linux is the, the user. Doesn't really matter. I mean, of course it might, it matters, but it, it, is, it is a winner because in a certain moment, companies decided that was easier for them to develop and to help Linux they're not then to work on their own competitors. And as you know, Intel, for example, supplies as much as 13% of Linux code. And most of Linux code, now more than 80%, is actually done by programmers who are paid by companies like IBM, like Amazon, like Intel, to develop Linux. It's no longer you know, a hobby done in a university dormitory, far from it. It's a professional development. We have seen this on the open source GIS. There was a time when, of course, I am developer of open source GIS from uh, since most of you were born, uh, before most of you were born. And but uh, nowadays, largely, we have a winner. The tendency of, of clustering between the winner is clear, both on the commercial open source and, of course, uh, with support from GDAO, PostGIS, and OGC. QGs has emerged as a winner on the open source GIS. So what's going to happen in the EO technology? I think it's safe. A safe bet is the situation will not remain fragmented too much for a so long time. I think the continued fragmentation is not the most likely outcome. Uh, a full commercial consolidation at this point uh, may hinder rather than and, and help uh, the SMMEs. I mean, if we have a concerted uh, commercial consolidation and right now of technology, it might help one or two companies, but not necessarily the bulk of SMEs in the world. So I would favor, but this is, let's say, not, not a wish, but something that will happen if people work together, uh, a more concerted convergence where where community did what they did with Linux, what they did with QGIS, at a certain moment, you decide, well, it's no longer economically viable or interesting for the company to continue to have an alternative to Linux. Let's use Linux itself. Well, that's what IBM did. And the other point which uh, help, let's say, supports this view is that more and more open source has ceased to be the kind of thing that was done by people, you know, in the university dormitory is completely voluntary for being an essential part of the big IT model. IBM brought, had, bought Head Head last year for more than 40 US billion dollars. The most used operating system in the world and it's Android powering more than 2.5 billion uh, devices. Linux is of course everywhere. If you use the cloud, you use Linux. Libraries like TensorFlow, three and a half million lines of code are free. MySQL powers Facebook. 
a part spark is uh, efficiently used for lots of things. And of course, uh, now R and Python have emerged as the new data analytics uh, tools. And uh, this is uh, the, the consultancy DB engines has now measured the popularity of open source versus commercial. From in a decade, open source uh, was more, let's say, uh, favored by one third of the respondents. And now half the respondents say they prefer open source and half of them are commercial licenses. So this shows, a, and this is on, I'm sorry to, to not to have said, this is on a critical area, databases. Because databases, you know, that is the new oil. So you would only trust your data to a reliable partner. And that's this convergence of open source and commercial means that open source is seen as a reliable partner. And the same thing in EO science. One of the important bits in EO science, everybody is rushing for the new gold, but the new gold is already there. The techniques that will empower the, let's say, this new brush for EO technologies are essentially techniques which are developed from other fields and applied to Earth's observation. These are essentially statistical and machine learning, deep learning. And these, they are available as open source software. That's a good thing because it's unlikely that SMMEs who devote 90% of their time for human to human interaction would have the time to develop an open so a, a proprietary breaking technology. So uh, libraries like Keras for TensorFlow who are available for deep learning who are available both in Python and in R, uh, XGB, which is a very good uh, machine learning techniques is open source. And we've seen this in, in packages which are EO learned. SITS is the package I developed for R for satellite image time series. And you have uh, the open data cube uh, technology. And so in other words, you would find that open source for EO is now no longer a, a joke, but or no, it was never, but now it, if you find that if you want to be serious about new technologies, you would find there is a lot out there already encapsulated in open source packages. The point here being that you cannot expect in a high risk area, in an area where a lot of resources from the private sector are devoted to, to customers, to, for the private sector to, especially SMMEs, to take all the risks. So in other words, the issue here of making big Earth observation data available to all and available to the global, and certainly to the global uh, perspective of uh, private industry, means that there must be a sharing of risks between public and private actors. And uh, Mariana Mazzucato, which is a professor at the, at the London School of Economics, she says this in a very nice book, which I recommend to you all, called Entrepreneurial State. The state has often actively co-shaped markets and taken high risks before the private sector was willing and able. This is especially true in the information economy. And uh, the famous John Maynard Keynes, which needs no introduction, said, the important thing for government is not to do with things which individuals are doing already, and, or to do things a little better and a little worse, but to do those things which are present are not done at all. And currently, many countries, many countries, uh, and, and, and of course, it, the companies and everyone faces an, an issue here which is uh, to consider that inevitably the big providers of IT and IT infrastructure will play a role and are playing a role in the provision of Earth observation uh, services. So this includes uh, the, what I call the MAGI, Microsoft, AWS, Google, and IBM. And this has led to a lot of uh, controversy because people, some, some of our partners and our members think they are global monopolies. Others would argue they're cost-effective platforms. And there, I think probably there is a grain of truth in both visions. But the deal here is that one of the issues of dealing with this, when you have such a global uh, uh, reaching 
infrastructure like Amazon or Google, one needs to consider that it would be on interest of all the SMEs, of all other players, a level playing field and the vendor independence. For this reason, GEO uh, has initiated with, of course, with the full help of a large community, a uh, community activity called the Open Earth Alliance. The idea of the Open Earth Alliance is to bring together all of those who are developing open source solutions for Big EO to achieve three important bits. Solutions which are vendor independent, solutions which level the playing field, and solutions which are globally accessible. It's not a question of fighting against the Maji, it's fighting with the Maji with a caveat that we're not dependent on one single player. And this is very important. The other bit that we expect is that the same thing will happen that has happened to Linux, which is starting from a community, uh, let's say, of unpaid developers, this will develop into a large community of both public and private individuals. So the public companies make the development, make the investment first, and then they are joined by private companies who will see in that developments, in that solutions, a lot of what they need and a lot of what they need to reach out to their customers. So this is the vision that GEO is pushing forward with the Open Earth Alliance, trying to benefit you all the companies which are really in need of support because this is a very much a fast changing field. And we think that considering open source as part of your business model should be something you should give a serious thought to. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kamara. That was really, really insightful. I personally could relate to your unique analogy. I think a lot of us have seen that and witnessed it. Very, very relevant. Just a question though, I, I think the large brands that you mentioned, they, they are truly well, well established, particularly if I speak from a South African context, and they invest very heavily in skills, in skills development, in building the developer community. Any suggestions here on what we could do to, to even potentially jump ahead of some of the open source trends that you're talking about in order to build an alternative skill set here. Okay, so let's look at, uh, I, I suppose you're talking about uh, specific EO companies or, or, or the, the IT as a whole? Well, EO in particular, as we're moving to different platforms, alternatives. Yes. No, uh, the, my, I, you're, I'm going to say something iconoplast. As a, there is no, you know, EO innovation on the private EO sector right now in the big companies. First of all, there are no big companies. There, mm -hmm. is, there are companies, is, yes, Arai is an extremely good company, but it's not EO-centered. It is, of course, ex excellent on what it delivers on the GIS, but uh, yes, Arai has is not been keen on the EO, uh, let's say, um, innovation. And for that matter, EO innovation these days is actually applying techniques which have been very successful at other applications, such as uh, deep learning, to specific EO problems. A lot of innovation is there. Uh, also handling big data cubes, a lot of innovation is there. But this handling of big data cubes, this application of machine learning, this application of new techniques is actually being pushed by open source solutions these days. A lot of it is in the open data cube and other applications, but the point here is you would find more innovation in open source CEO than you would find in proprietary solutions these days. Very good, very good, sir. Thank you very much again, Gilberto, for your time and for your insights. We look forward to catching up with you later on and over the next two days. Thank you Our so much. Our next speaker is the Geo Secretariat Executive uh, Committee co-chair, and he's also the Deputy Director General for Technology Innovation in the Department of Science and Innovation in South Africa. Our very own Dr. Moafe, sir, welcome. Thank you very, very much for taking some time out from the plenary and spending it with us. Uh, we're really looking forward to your insights. 
So I'm going to hand over to you directly. Okay, uh, thank you so much. So I just want to thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you about this very important topic uh, been grappling with in Geo for, for the past. And I do think that it is important to highlight that when we talk about the need for industry participation in Geo, one of the things that is really quite crucial is that uh, there are a number of big issues that we have to deal with. Is the role of the impact of um, the industry partnership in the community, of inclusivity in the geo context, and also that we need to find ways of creating um, fertile grounds for partnerships. And these partnerships will need that we have all stakeholders and industries are part of it. And, and as a topic says uh, that I provided, it's really about how these partnerships can actually be helpful in times such as these. And now we also need to look at that role in the context of um, COVID-19 and also how we as South Africa has And I really also want for these partnerships to happen and to have an impact, we actually need to sow the seed. It is not going to happen automatically, but we need to work towards and building this partnership. Now, what are the big issues that we have to deal with? Uh, and, and how would this address them? To look at the issues of disease outbreaks, we are currently in the eye of the storm when it comes to COVID-19. When we thought we were actually uh, coming out, then we realized we we're actually getting deeper into the challenge. We got the issue of climate change and food security. We got issues of of um, uh, challenges such as droughts, flooding, and fires. And when you look at all those things, there is a sense of interconnectedness between them. So you got them being changed and also them also having an impact on the health issues. And now, how do we actually use that partnership to also look at the economy of the fish? It is being uh, dubbed the sexual economy and it's mainly the use of energy, especially renewable energies. So I think that issues that are in humanity currently, it's no doubt that globally dealing with new challenges are inequality, poverty, and then unemployment. And insofar as what the industry partnerships should do, one of the things is that it needs to help us achieve the aspect of inclusivity. And inclusivity here, we're talking about the fact that when we talk about industry involvement for in earth observation, we should only be talking the big players. We also need to look at small, uh, medium, and uh, micro enterprises. We also need to look at what we call the um, geographic uh, signature. So we, we cannot just talk about industry partnership that actually excludes certain region. And here in GEO, our argument is primarily to say that we do not want, when we talk industry partnership, about industry partners that are coming from Europe and from the USA, but also we need to look at a participation by Africa, by Asia, and South America. And then I have also mentioned the issue uh, the, the Planning, uh, special planning and, and land usage. And this for us is quite crucial because when we do not ensure that special planning encompasses or embraces the concept of uh, inclusivity, then we run the risk of having challenges that comes with bad planning, whether it is in terms of our settlements, whether it is in terms of our cities and towns. But we need to make sure that earth observation and in partnership with industry takes care of these things. And these are going to be enabled if we have got targeted human capacity development programs. And as we always say in GEO, capacity development has to be central to every single activity that we embark on so that we can be able to bridge that gap of inequality. And we do that by making sure we promote the participation by youth, participation by women, those people who have got this, and we need to be able to reach to the disabled, to the advantage. So in other words, for us, when we talk about the building of the global earth observation system, system that system cannot be a complete 
sister Lucy ADP doesn't go wide enough to the rural area, go wide enough to those in the urban who may be excluded for one way or another. And if we address that, we'll find that opportunities that come through this partner will also help us to deal with matters of poverty, employment, um, and also uh, the of, of food security, et cetera, et cetera. So we therefore need to always be mindful that there are huge impact that we need to do that. So I have mentioned the issues of regional representation, SME representation, gender equity, and youth focus. And those are challenges that as, as, as the Earth Observing Community, we need to always be mindful of. Now, how do we rebuild the fertile ground for partnerships? And I'm going to really reflect on some of the examples. And the critical thing here, government actually has to take leadership. And the examples that I want to use here in South Africa is the program that we have embarked on, which is looking at the establishment of the uh, Space Infrastructure Hub. We need to make sure that the effect bone that created primarily that is done through government. We have the basic infrastructure. You therefore are able to make sure that the barriers of entries are lowered so that that small enterprise that wants to get into the business in, in providing as, um, observation services they can actually come in without having to invest hugely. So Paisa in is a company based in China. It's our great pleasure to have So, so, so I, I, I therefore would like to say we need to make sure that we build uh, the space infrastructure and in this case, in South Africa, ensuring the government leads that process. And our newly launched uh, space infrastructure hub will actually enable that the barrier of entry even by the smallest uh, enterprise is actually uh, breached. Now, the one thing is again to look at what are the opportunities for earth observations in the economy? And now in South Africa, we've got uh, a very long, um, uh, 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 which is more than 3,000 kilometers. And that is really where opportunities for earth observations are actually. And in this instance, I would like to refer to what we're doing through the National Oceans and Coastal Information Management System. And here there are opportunities for players to come in um, in providing various services where government can actually benefit by partnering and ensuring that the data and information that is gathered is uh, enabling us to ensure the security of those fishermen who are out there. They get information to enable them to know when to get in, uh, where there's going to be, for example, the... Um, algal bloom that can uh, impact on the uh, fishing, where it's going to be um, uh, various dangers that may be brought by all sorts of adverse, adverse temperatures and weather conditions. So this, again, as a government, having introduced what we call the operations KISA for ocean security, let us look at how we can stimulate the South African economy on the basis of what can be done from the oceans. We are creating that opportunity for industry to get involved and to partner uh, with government in providing all sorts of earth observation services. I just want to say again, this is hand in hand with the infrastructure hub that I've indicated earlier on. So in other words, as government, there needs to be opportunities created for ensuring that we can stimulate our economy um, through earth observations, but by then ensuring that as government, we want to drive the um, ocean economy without the role that uh, Earth observations can play and the uh, role that uh, various partners in the industry can actually uh, be involved in. So, um, again, when you look at um, what we're doing around the ocean's economy, there are also opportunities, for example, for manufacturing of satellites. And that making sure that when you manufacture those satellites, you also need to be mindful of what other, um, uh, for, for example, um, uh, uh, it, 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 interconnections can you bring in when you bring in satellites for observations, satellite, for example, that can also ensure that there is rural connectivity for, for internet, uh, issues around vessel tracking, 
institute data on transportation, et cetera. And beginning to do is to be to build the um the, the, the network of industry that are lining through the value chain. Because that when you have a satellite, you also are looking at other aspects that can develop the whole industry throughout. And, and that network is going to enable us as a country, for example, that have to deal with all sorts of challenges, whether it is around education provisions, health provisions. So you begin to find that that infrastructure begins so to be so entrenched in what you want a country in a manner that when you invest on in one thing, you actually stimulate a value chain that is going to have what we call the virtuous cycle in terms of making sure that the economy is just then going to be sparked to grow. So we also need to look at the role and opportunities that exist in terms of partnerships with industry in times of disasters. Now, now of COVID-19, governments have been working very hard to try and manage this, and we all know that there have been a lot of challenges. And one thing that uh, the COVID-19 outbreak has helped us to understand is that between government, industry, civil societies is actually very crucial. And here we have started to see all sorts of services that are being provided, the innovation that is coming in through uh, the private sector, whether it is a vision of, um, uh, uh, you know, ventilators, uh, uh, protection equipment, etc., diagnostics, but also just monitoring the situations in terms of what is happening uh, on 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 the aspect of the promotion of or the, the incitement of these uh, um, these diseases in terms of how they are spreading. How you look at the settlements. Uh, here we were able to do the mapping of settlements in terms of uh, the desification, in terms of it's easy for you to get into certain settlements, are they, they raw structure? Can you be bringing in water tankers for people to be able to have access to water, those who didn't have initially? And again, these partnerships, whether it's in terms of making sure that the things are happening and providing all that data feed, feeding back into government, the role of industry has been quite crucial. Government in itself couldn't uh, manage to do that. Just the mo mobile telephony com communication company, in terms of just making sure that you can track the movements of people, you can track the movements of goods and services, and where you know that uh, certain uh, goods need to be at a point in time, you're also able to plan which kind of roads, roads are going to use. For us, really, the outbreak of COVID has actually made us realize the value and importance of these partnerships in terms of even understanding where some of the uh, delivery routes for food that needs to reach communities that don't have access to food can happen. And again, I want to say these are the sort of things that if we look at government and say government is going to do it on its own, it's not going to happen. So how do we really seed the industry partnerships in Asians? Firstly, we need to make sure that we establish regional industry uh, communities of practice. Now, if we are wanting to fight on issues of equity and inclusiveness, we cannot expect at global level to be running everything. So that means that there is a lot of challenge to both regional uh, geo establishments and to national geos to be able to mobilize the industry sector, teach them continuously about opportunities that may come. Some of the opportunities may not be a error, but when you begin to engage industry, industry is able to say, oh, by the way, we can actually provide X, Y, and Z. So I therefore want to say, if we want to seriously engage and involve uh, industry in uh, geo and in earth observations, we need to make sure that we establish communities of practice that will involve our industry sectors. Then we also need to make sure that there are general, general um, engagements that, you know, I've mentioned issues of local industry. So here in South Africa, um, 
a good example is what we're doing now uh, with the organizers of this particular event. We are beginning to say, why, how do we begin to have sectors that can mobilize themselves around this particular aspect of net observations, space in general, but begin to really look and sniff out opportunities. Let's promote entrepreneurship as well, because there are people there who got ideas, but who have never thought of this of entrepreneurship in these areas. And then let us ensure that we promote collaboration between small and large enterprises. Because again, agility within the small enterprises reaction is quite important. And large enterprises, while they've got all the resources, sometimes it takes a lot of time for decisions to be taken. And you find that the quickness that the small enterprises have is actually going to be tapped on if they are collaborations. Yes, indeed, there's going to be competitions, but we also need to know when to compete and when to collaborate. So I just want to say, I think um, when we talk about your going forward, we cannot talk about it just as a membership-based uh, organization. We we'll talk about various governments that are members and also now um, creating organizations that are generally your um, uh, government entities and agencies. We also need to really look at how do we tap into the richness of industry to build the capacity and to make sure that the global system of system is actually realized. Because if we exclude other players, then this system is never going to be an inclusive one. So I really end with that, that let's continue to build this partnership, let's nurture them, let's learn from one another, and actually let's pick up those things to make sure elevate the role of observation uh, to all corners of the earth. Thank you very much. And Beneni, thank you so very much for such an insightful talk. Uh, um, uh, apologies for the technical gremlins up front, but you've more than compensated with that, with the, with the content you've shared. Thank you. We have, we have one very interesting question that's been posed uh, um, from the audience. At GEO, we work on three Gs, gender, geography, and generation. How do you suggest we align this practically with SMME engagement? Anything so, you so could so share around that? Yeah, so, so the point that I really mentioned around inclusivity yes. is that we, we, we have realized, and especially here uh, when we're working with AfriGeo, uh, which is our regional um, uh, mechanism of gauging the rest continent in Earth observations, is that ours are mainly the small players. And, and when you do not engage them, you are leaving out a lot of creativity that is sitting with the small players. The big players will really be quite crucial in uh, sometimes providing that infrastructure and bigger reach, but there are always um, small um, opportunities for small players. For example, if you are going to want to service a typical municipality in a rural area, like in Limpopo, Mpumalanga, etc., you are not going to ask Google to help you do those things. Mm -hmm. But you're going to really find a player that has the integrities of that particular locality. So that's why I'm saying, adding to those many Gs, mm -hmm. when we really call into crisis, let us really understand the fact that the issue of relevance is going to be brought upon by local players that are generally small, and they're able to have that agility to even know what kind of services are relevant to our own location. Fantastic. I, I think the, the mere sense of inclusivity drives us to, to realize those, those, those aspects inside uh, the three Gs. Dr. Murphy, thank you very much again for your time. Um, we're going to stop there and we're going to pause for a few minutes. The next set of sessions start at just around 10 o'clock which is South African time, GMT plus two. And just a reminder, this is when we'll move into, into two separate streams. The expert talk starts off, and at the same time, we're going to kick off with profiling our three SMEs, SMMEs uh, around Earth observation so solutions from around the world. So enjoy the leg stretch. If that's what you need, get yourself a cup of coffee, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>